so good. I'm we're in a pub. Uh, I would say it's like two weeks in a row, but it's not because we're we've recording back to back. So actually, we're in the same pub that we're in on the last podcast. They only don't about need to twenty know minutes that. apart. They don't need to know that. Yeah, but it kind of moderates all, expectations. All the things that have happened in between. Well, about half a pint. Spend half a bit, a pint, it? Wimbledon. <laughs> well, that's in the future. We're, Wimbledon is still in the future. Yeah, maybe not when this comes out. And do you know what? The most annoying thing about Wimbledon. I wasn't going to do this. This wasn't going to be my name chatter. But the most annoying thing about you know I play a lot of squash. Yes, a huge amount of squash. With a guy, I'm not. I'm not the world's best squash player anymore. I was never the world's best squash player, to be fair. Carry on. But I used to be a better squash player than I am in my late fifties. Um, and the the guy who strings my racket is the head stringer at Wimbledon. So I lose him from Queens onwards. He can't string my rackets, and I get through a racket a week. Norman playing squash. Well, you Springs. hit the ball very hard. I do hit the ball very uh, hard. Yeah. I think Wimbledon should uh, give him back. Mm. Because they're letting somebody who was once really good and not quite as good as they were, but still pretty good. I'll give him a shout. Paul yeah. Skip. Paul Skip, the Go master Skippy. stringer. Skippy yeah. strings. Um, anyway, I, what I was going to say was that, um, so today we're doing a podcast about IP in the music industry, which is really exciting. And um, I'm I'm a bit of a Desert Island Discs fan. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm a, I got into listening to podcasts. Neil, who should be in the room, but he's not, he's disappeared somewhere. When, it, when he was encouraging us to do podcasts, he suggested to me I should listen to some podcasts. So I've been listening to podcasts, but I also started to then listen to Desert Island Discs because yes. it just happens to be on there. You've um, been I for 10 it. records. No, 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 no. I'm not, not, <laughs> it's eight, so no, I'm not going to do that at all. <laughs> but last week, I was listening to someone, and you came into my mind as I was listening. Ed Sheeran. Because the, the, the physical resemblance is extraordinary. Yeah. The mu- <laughs> The musical resemblance. Oh, Besso. honestly, no. Oh, oh. But it, but he said something on the po- <laughs> he, he said something on Desert Island Discs, which actually I know is something that they, I guess want to talk about. So that's quite so yes. it kind of it can get us there. But he was talking about the fact that the music industry had died. Um, so he was talking about it from the from the perspective that there can be no future creativity because anything that could have ever possibly have been written has been written. Um, and I think this is because he's found himself involved in quite a lot of copyright, copyright yeah, sort of Yeah, because that was his issues. point, wasn't it? There's only so many, yeah. there's only 13 notes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, so it's, it's now physically impossible that's... to come up with anything new and original. He is was, that why you do copies? That was a straw man argument. That's not true. Uh, okay. That's not true. I just didn't know why, why you only did copies in your okay. band. Because, oh, because, oh, yeah, we can't make up new songs. But that's yeah. not nothing to do with the fact there are only 13 notes. It's just that we just like the way they've been used already. 13 notes? Yeah, there's all the ones in between. All black ones. I don't understand music. Yeah. I am... I am that's about right. It's 12. <laughs> you can't bring the guests in yet. We've not introduced them. Oh, no. <clears throat> 12. I'm, I am... A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's seven, right? And that's five. That's five. It's 12. <laughs> 12. <laughs> 12. <laughs> I was just thinking about the black notes on the piano. Yeah, it's 12. So 12. Okay, 12. Yeah. So not 13. No, no, so that's one less. Uh, oh, you, we, so, you could have worked that out for yourself. Uh, Sorry. I, I was in a band for a good number of years, but I'm musically incompetent. You wouldn't so. play with the Black Eyed Peas, actually. I, no, no, you got me up once and then started playing some stupid song that I'd never heard Word before in my up, life. Word up, you said you knew. No, what? I, I ended up doing that. Yo, pretty ladies around the world, yada yeah, yada. I, I kind of yeah. vaguely knew the yeah, tune, yeah. but as if I was going to know the lyrics or something like that. Exactly. Come on, I'm a late yeah. 70s, it's Stranglers. You're not in your late 70s, are you? <laughs> no, my musical taste. Oh, my right. musical taste reside in the late 70s, Stranglers. <laughs> Lee Davis and Willem Roberts are the two IPs in the pod, and you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property, brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. Go on we, so far. Should, should we do the guests? Yes. Ian, Nick, can you introduce yourselves, please? Let's start with whoever, well, whoever wants to go first. Oh, I can. I'm Ian Russell. Uh, yeah, patent attorney, wannabe rock star. <laughs> Um, woo woo! Patterns only! Are the two compatible? Yeah, I think so. There's quite a lot of, you know, musical patterns attorneys, I think. Yeah, you know, there people, are, aren't there? Yeah. I think, you know, often the science and sort of music, I think, come in. Brian Cox. You know, Brian Wasn't Cox. He? Brian yeah. Cox. Um, He's not a pattern attorney. Brian May? He's not a pattern attorney. Hang on, there's May. a connection here. <laughs> a lot of Brian's. There's a lot of Brian. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, it's, I think it's something that, you know, it, maybe the two go hand in hand. I don't know. Yeah, so music and patents, really. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting you say that. Sorry, Nick, we'll get to you in a minute. Apologies. Right. Um, but I've always thought that I was musically inept, incompetent, whatever it might be. In fact, the guy who was the guitarist... Both. both. Yeah, both, yeah. The guy who was the guitarist in our band, who just seemed to be able to do stuff like without really thinking about it, I'm sure he was thinking about it a lot, he used to try and teach me to play the guitar. 
And he would always say to me, can you stop trying to think about what you're doing? Because I used to, I wanted to understand it. You know, so why does those fingers in that position make this? And what is this? And, and I spent so long trying to think about it. He just decided that I could never, ever play anything. Um, and that's been my experience right through my life when it comes to trying music. Yeah, I think <clears throat> there's a few different sort of, I don't mean schools of thought, but a few, you know, a few different, I guess, like attitudes towards music. Because my music theory knowledge is pretty low. Um, I've always, I've, you know, played and written my own music and I don't really know, like, theory wise what I'm doing. It's just like on a keyboard, you know, press some buttons if it sounds good. You know, that, that works. How, how do you remember which buttons to press again? Um, I don't know. There's 12 of them. <laughs> you can, you can, you know, you can, you can write it down using whatever form of notation. So it doesn't have to be proper musical stuff. I, I, I couldn't write out proper music uh-huh. you know, okay. kind of myself on a keyboard. I, I think I just tend to remember it. Um, I kind of mainly play bass and there are various different ways of, you know, writing out bass, you know, common one is tab, but I tend to, yeah, I tend to just write down sort of not random numbers, but just a few numbers so rather than thinking, oh, this is a G or this is a B, for me, it's like three on this string. Yeah, 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 like gotcha. Five on that yeah. string. Yeah. And if someone said, what note is that? I'd be like, no idea. You know, it's a, it's a three or a five. And I know that if I if I go, you know, two strings down and two to the right, it's the same note. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I've I've just kind of, yeah, learned to play through some random method of experience. Uh, and it's tended to work fine in bands so yeah put sheet music in front of me i can't play it stick me in a you know a little bit of a jam and i give it a go yeah you can work it um, but i think there's no right and wrong it works it works for me and you know uh, I, i've always tended to write my own music rather than play covers um if you're playing covers it's probably better to you know it's, it's quite helpful to be able to read music and or at least understand it uh, yeah to some degree Nick, let's bring you in. Tell, oh, are, are you going to tell us now that you are some piano virtuoso? No, and, no, I'm, no, no. I'm completely incompetent when it comes to anything oh, with, excellent. with playing music. I'm also, though, a wannabe rock star. Uh, <laughs> but what I did was realise at quite an early age that I was always going to be a wannabe rock star rather than a rock star. So I joined the music industry in 1992 so that it would give me the, the opportunity to meet and work with some of my musical heroes, which I was very, very fortunate to do. Uh, most of them are now dead, which is why I'm no longer That's working nothing to do with you. you. No, you're nothing not, to you're, do you're with not, me. You're not some kind of musical their... serial killer. Or no, well, like I, I, I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I am. But, um, you know, I stop going to music award ceremonies these days. I've never heard of anyone who wins any awards except the Lifetime Achievement Awards. So, you know, it, it, that, that's me. I'm a lawyer. Uh, an intellectual property lawyer who specialises in copyright, music industry copyright disputes, uh, and uh, have been doing that really for 30 years. Drop some names. Band, <laughs> was it? Of, of band. Uh, yeah, of yeah. Names in, in what yeah. context? The, the cool dis- people. That you e- either side. We don't care. people you okay. killed. <laughs> let, 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 let's name drop. Yes. Together with Sir Ray Davis... Of the Kinks, Kinks, yes. yeah. We saved the life of Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Wow, that's a big. Nice that's name. a fair claim to fame, isn't a good it? One, yeah. That's a very. So you know, that's you, given me great you, vibration. You know, you, know, you, know, you, you, know, you get uh, these quizzes sometimes. Tell, tell me three things about yourself, two of which are true and one's a complete lie. That's one of the three which is would be in it because it's true. Um, so I, I met them. Um, been involved with a lot of my heroes, actually. I mean, you mentioned the Stranglers earlier. I mean, they're musical heroes of mine. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And I saw them a couple of times this year, actually, at Brixton and, and in Guildford. The Brixton gig was... I, I, didn't, I wasn't there, but I've been able to catch up with it online. Both were fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic, because I've been watching them since the late 70s. So it, it was a great opportunity to meet the people that I respect, and I'm still working with, with some of them, those that are still alive. Can I, can I do a couple of musical anecdotes before I hand over to you? Because you're going to take over. No, let me, let me, let, can let, we just ask him how we saved Brian Wilson's life? Oh, yeah, go on. Let's do that. <laughs> we need this. This is podcast. I want to know how podcast we saved podcast gold. Yeah. We were at the... Uh, there's a music awards ceremony called the Ivan Novello Awards, which is to recognise songwriters, organised by a company I used to work for called PRS. And that year, I think Brian Wilson won some kind of award. And Ray Davis presented him with the award. And after the award ceremony, there was like a private party. 
And I don't know if you've met Brian Wilson or seen him, but he's actually a really tall bloke. He, he's very tall and quite stocky. And Ray Davis and I were talking to him either side of, of, of Brian. And Brian was standing next to this low balcony at the Grosvenor House Hotel, which got a big drop. And I don't know why, I can guess, but he was swaying. <laughs> he was swaying. It was sort of swaying and it like a pendulum. And each time he sort of moved from side to side, he swayed that bit more. And I looked at Ray Davis and he looked at me and we could see that in about two or three more sways, <laughs> he was going to topple over this balcony. And so instinctively, both of us rushed and grabbed one arm each and pulled him away. Uh, and I've met Ray Davis a few times since then. I mean, I don't know him well, but I, I know him well enough to talk to. Um, we never talk about it. <laughs> but um, it, it was a really surreal moment. <laughs> and there's quite a few examples of that, actually, in my checkered career in the music industry. Oh, let, let me do a little Stranglers anecdote, yeah, which, is no, which is nothing really to the Stranglers, but the very first time I performed anything live anywhere on stage or whatever it was. So I used to be in a band in Portsmouth. Um, I'm musically inept, so I sang. What was it called, sorry? It was called The Genius Id. <laughs> what? That's, that's, that's so meaningful. It's about, it's about as pretentious as it comes, it's isn't it? It's the sort of thing you come up with when you're kind of like 15, 16. And... Id's now. <laughs> you're going to look up id? Well, it's not your ego, is it? It's not, it's not your ego. It's it, is it? Part, it is part of the ego, yeah. Um, and... So we did a Stranglers cover and it was like a talent competition. That was the first time we'd done anything and we hadn't really realised that it wasn't a talent competition for bands. So we ended up being in this kind of bingo hall with some rubbish kind of Portsmouth comedians and some rubbish kind of Portsmouth acts. And then we had to kind of assemble all of our gear, which I didn't know how that happened. People mm. stood and then we did peaches to a load of old kind of blue rinse grannies in a bingo hall. And um, <laughs> it sort of... Was it wasn't the greatest musical moment of my life? And then the, my other my other claim to fame yeah. is um, so we're talking eighty one maybe I'm sixteen ish something like that, mm. um, and um, kind of gigging around Pompey and stuff like that. And one night we happened to be um, we were actually in Southampton this night. It wasn't Portsmouth in Southampton, sharing a venue with the Smiths who were then doing kind of like one of their very first early. And I'm, I'm a big big fan of the Smiths. Mm. Um, so I, I, I have the claim to fame that Morrissey told us that we should give up. <laughs> <laughs> and very shortly thereafter, we did. Yeah. The genius <laughs> id was no um, more. No, I, the id was destroyed, exactly right. Let's move from id, or ID, to IP. Oh, you're getting... Uh, 62 <laughs> podcasts in and you've started to get the segue. It's brilliant. Oh, oh. Go on then. Ian... <laughs> so, it's almost right, right as if you're reading it. <laughs> no, no. Um, biggest up on the UK music industry. Yeah, so, I mean, Nick will have thoughts as as well on this, maybe a bit different from mine, I guess. I think we're amazing, like, absolutely amazing at music and, you know, music, music tech. Um, you know, if you think of amp manufacturers, hi-fi companies, you know, a lot of the, the best known companies are in the UK and I think it's something that we you know can and should be really proud of and you know a lot of artists current and over how many decades have been you know British British acts and I think it's something that we do a lot of things we do quite a lot of things well and I think we do music and the surrounds really really well yeah I think I think it's something to be really proud of. So I'm feeling a little bit daft at this moment in time. I, being kind of like the non-IP expert, although I've been with Sleepy for 10 years, so I've kind of absorbed quite a lot by now. I was thinking to myself, I don't understand. I'm, I'm getting why we might be talking about copyright and stuff like that, but I can't get why we might be talking about patents. But within seconds now, I'm thinking, of course, there's a whole lot of tech involved, isn't there? So can I just chuck two things at you, Ian, if that's okay? Please. So, so the first is, talk, talk us through a little bit about how patents relate to music just just in in general terms and then the second thing that i kind of thought about in terms of when you were talking there is what leads invention that leads to patenting is it the tech or does the music come first and does the tech kind of then come in to make the music happen it, does that make sense yeah 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 i guess on the on the first question you know how are patents relevant to music um and kind of music technology i guess 
in a lot of different sectors. You know, you think about all the different forms of IP, and you know, sometimes it's not it's not always that obvious. You know how trademarks might come in or copyright or, yeah. or patents but yeah as, as you say it's more on the you know the tech side of things so things like musical instruments you know a lot of R&D and innovation goes into them if you think of a guitar there's so many different bits there's the string there's the body there's the neck yeah. mm-hmm. how you tune them plug in a lead what to go into how do people hear it the plectrum that you play with the strap you know there are so many patents on all of those sorts of things um and then, you know, how you record music, how you reproduce it at home. So, yeah, I think in, in any sector where there's you know, technical innovation, there's the opportunity for, for patenting and, and music's, you know, not, not an exception there. Yeah. I've got a huge collection of guitar pedals I don't know how to use. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the tech as well sitting behind all that must be... Is it, how is innovation going now? Is, hasn't a lot of it been done now? Um, I don't think so. I think I think you know at a broad level you could say, well, you know, yeah, guitar pedals have been around and they do chorus and reverb and distortion, overdrive and delay and there's tuners and you know plug them together and how flanger, you... yeah, my faves exactly. Flanger. You know, there's flanger. there's there's all sorts of things, but it's it, it can be you know stepping away from patents. You know what they look like because you know there are really funky pedal designs. Um, that, you know, people spend a a lot of time on it might want to protect but you know within it there's the you know there's the circuitry um there's kind of you know the, the the software what sound goes in what comes out what technology manipulates the sound in that way um and you can get like really 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 compu- complicated pedals um you know some that emulate a whole kind of setup so yeah. rather than putting a guitar through an, a, an amp you plug your guitar into the pedal it sort of you know emulates an amp and then it just comes out of the PA as if it's gone yeah. through an amp and you know there's a lot of complexity uh, in that in a, in a technical sense um, but yeah I think th- there are instruments and sort of things still to be invented but then within each of those categories there's opportunities for innovation and improvement. What do you see in your practice mostly where are the areas of patenting? So I guess across my practice generally most of my work is kind of computer implemented inventions, telecoms, bits of kind of mechanical and electrical. And I'd say that possibly it's the same on the musical side of things. I think there's a, it's, you know, it tends to be either electronics or software um, in, in terms of music tech. And I think this, the software side of things is really interesting you know, because I've, I've worked on a lot of software patents that aren't related to music and I'm seeing kind of more of that and more interest in that in relation to music. I was actually involved in an AI uh, music generation patent. Um, the guy came in, have I told you this before? No. The guy came no. in um, with, it was a MIDI and he'd written a bit of code that could write. What's a MIDI? The kind of the 8-bit music like you get out of Nintendo's back end. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. kind of level of... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's kind of a tone and nothing else. But he'd developed a basic algorithm for generating reasonably nice sounding music um, from a, from a uh, at that level, but with huge ambition to, to get further. And I think we I forget don't know what the patent claim was, but we we found something to go down. Um, and his genius was he was a he, he had a degree in music from Cambridge. It wasn't it wasn't unknowledgeable. He's also a very good salesperson as well, actually. But his he did actually do brilliantly well, and it was all about the computer. There wasn't a, yeah. by the end of it, there was no there was no physical instrument involved at any point. And in the end, I remember it doesn't exist now. He he got bought, but his website could go and you could just choose a mood and a length, and it'd give you an immediate piece of music with a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you could go difficult fifth point. Yes, yeah. well, that, that is. That, I mean, that's. What would, you, what, would your, what would your track song be for that? A difficult fifth, fifth point. Difficult I don't know. I wouldn't know where to go. It's going to be Led Zeppelin, isn't it? A bit of Led Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. I've never really been kind of a heavy metal sort of person. They are heavy metal, aren't they? Is that, are they? Yeah, I'd say heavy. Well, we've got, we've got, well, where do you put Led Zeppelin on the, the music spectrum? For me, it's gentle rock. Gentle rock. Yeah. <laughs> you, no, hang on. So, heavy. when That's you got in heavy. touch, you do death thrash. What do you do again? <laughs> <laughs> Did I make that up? Yeah, it's quite. It's easy yeah. listening for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're talking, you know, double double kick, fast, fast drums, yeah. drop tuning, more shouting than singing. That's What's drop tuning? 
that when you uh, do... So on um, a guitar, you have standard tuning, E, A, D, G, B, oh, you E, and you can... One standard drop tuning is you drop the, the E to a D, right. and it means that instead of playing normal power chords mm-hmm. like that, you can just use one finger. A okay, bar chord. Yeah, kind of like a bar chord, except you don't do the, the, the bottom bit normally, and it's, it's, it's deep, because the deepest note that you get is like a D oh, or a D. Okay. But some people go multiple steps further, so rather than your sort of deepest note being a D, you can go down to C... B, A. But then the string and, falls off the guitar eventually, doesn't it? Yeah, you've got to work out how to keep it in tune and yeah. stop the string flapping around. But you can get really deep and dirty tones from that, which, depending on the style of music, you want. This, re- this really happens to me on this podcast, but I do not have the faintest idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a string. <laughs> but, but, deep, I, deep, dirty noises. But what I love about that, what I love about that is somebody, this is, this is for me, this is kind of schoolboy guitar. This is people in their rooms before they know what the rules are, thinking, I'm going to completely make up... Like Jimi Hendrix playing feedback. Yeah. And then suddenly everyone says, oh, it's a really good idea to put your guitar by the thing. And you go, woo, woo, woo. It's... There was, there was something that you, you mentioned a moment ago that... Because I think it's really it's really interesting, which is MIDI. Mm. Um, if, it's, if it's okay just to touch on that briefly, because it's been around for a long time. And it's, it's like a, a sort of a protocol in a way, a, you know, most people know it in terms of yeah, sort of eight bit music, and you know, you used to get a MIDI file and it'll play a song, and it's like a bit computery. But it's it's a lot more than it's a lot more than that. So, for example, you can have a MIDI file that sort of stores a load of information, and if you run that through a what's called a virtual instrument, so something on a computer that you know mimics an instrument, if you put it through a keyboard one, it'll play you know a keyboard tune because it just says okay this note is an a it's like someone's pressing an a and the midi file contains information like how long you're holding your finger down velocity and that sort of thing but if you run it through like a drum virtual instrument it'll say an a oh that's a kick drum and something else is a cymbal so if if you're recording drums on an electric drum kit into a computer it will save it as a midi file and you put it through a drum program and it sounds like drums and if you record music on a keyboard it saves it as a midi file and it comes out sounding like a keyboard so it's it's something that's been ar- around for quite a long time but it's really first time quite quite interesting and mm. you know looking at new uses of of midi is is, is quite interesting as well well i find it interesting so I, I said at the outset that i was musically incompetent i had no idea how incompetent <laughs> i was I've, yeah i, I... I'm, 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 I, th- I think I'm I was un- unconsciously incompetent, and now I'm consciously incompetent <laughs> in terms of um, yeah, nice. se- se- semi consciously There is a really good scene in one of the Bill and Ted films where they um, bring people through in the time machine, and they bring Mozart and Beethoven or something through, and they give them a modern setup with a rock band, and basically Mozart and Beethoven go mental on this kind of fantastic rock band that they put together, loving every minute of it. And actually that sums it up for me, is that those music, they, they, the musicians seeing new tools and new, new, new possibilities go, go crazy for it. It's worth it. I want to bring Nick in, because Nick's not spoken yet, and, yeah. I, and he needs to. He yeah. saved Brian Wilson. We need to I give saved him Brian, time. that's what he needs to know. <laughs> so, and I, and I, know that, I know that Nick was probably most interested in the kind of music is dead question so because it's we, we, were talk, we were talking about just briefly about me before we started recording the the concept that music the industry, that, is, the dead. industry is dead yeah. the industry is dead so tell us a little bit about your well first just to pick up on what ian said just now about the uk being a, a leader in music and all things to do with music i completely agree with that the only thing i would disagree with is that it's no longer the uk that uh is earning all the money from music you look at the major record companies, they're not UK owned. Sony's Japanese. Universal, biggest record company in the world, is French. Warner's, I think, are German or American. Cobalt is, is German. Where's, where's Rough Trade? Rough Trade is English, but it's not, it's not one of the major record companies. And it's the same with the major music publishers. So all the money that's being earned, ultimately, is not generated, uh, is not accruing to UK owners and that is important because that money is not then not reinvested back in the uk music industry and, and that's an important point but you know you've, you've two or three times used the words music industry i think i joined the music industry in 1992 
But by the time I left working for a music industry organisation in 2008, I wasn't working in a music industry. I was working for financial services industry. What we were doing was matching through numbers uh, songs against owners and collecting the royalties from uh, the use of a song and paying it to the right person. And it was all done all, so, automated. So just, just, commod- just commodities? It, it was. You could have been dealing with credit cards. Yeah, and it's no coincidence that our former chief executive had been uh, the chief executive of, uh, I think it was uh, Nat West or or uh, one of these other you know, financial services companies. In between, I worked in a computer industry, I think, because everything had to be computerized and a lot of sis- new systems were put in. But the music industry really doesn't exist anymore. So I agree with what's being said by uh, Ed Sheeran, although for different reasons. Um, but there is still a music scene which exists in songwriting. I mean, someone would write a song irrespective of whether they're going to earn money from it. They can earn money from it, great. But you don't write songs just because you want to earn money. You do it because it's an expression of your I- emotions. A, a, a strap line which I used to use a lot was music is how emotions sound. And I think that's a really good description of the importance of music. But unfortunately, the people that earn the money from the expression of your emotions are usually not you, unless you are one of the very, very um, successful individual composers. And a lot of those people in the 60s, for example, made no money at all from uh, their, their compositions. Now people make more money, but still not enough to put them in the in the in the realms of the real high earners, which is where they should be. The money is earned by the major corporations. And if if you're kind of a young person, I know it's difficult for us to imagine young people, <laughs> but they exist, Gwilym. They exist. Yeah. Um, well, how do they think? Hey, we've both got children. They're young people. I don't understand them at all. Though. <laughs> <laughs> so if you but if you're a young person thinking about, um, so first of all, you just make music, don't you? You just kind of get together, with mates, and you make music. Yeah. We. Well, I didn't with my mates. We made like a messy, soundy thing that kind of. Uh, um, and you called to Morrison. Yeah, yeah, but you so you get together, you make music and stuff like that, and eventually someone might pay you to kind of perform somewhere and, yeah. and so on. So you, your your mind turns to making money out of music. Yeah. When did your mind turn to IP? De- it depends. For for a long time, copyright was part of the national curriculum. Copyright law and copyright law awareness was part of the curriculum to teach people how to to teach people at school uh, to understand the respect for protecting anything that was created. You probably don't become aware of IP as a musician though until you realise that you can make money from protecting what you've done. Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, if, if you've written a song and someone then takes your song, and you mentioned the Stranglers earlier, and there's plenty of examples with the Stranglers. Uh, If someone takes your song, and uh, you're not earning anything from the success of their composition, then you you start thinking about IP, or your manager does, or your publisher does, or your lawyer does. And IP is there to ensure that you are properly rewarded for your um, creative process. You mentioned the Stranglers earlier. The Strang- one of the f- most famous songs of Stranglers is No More Heroes, yep. I'm sure you know. Yep. Uh, a band in the early 2000s called Elastica. Then, if you remember Elastica? Yeah, 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 yeah. They did a song, I can't remember what it was called now, but the opening of it was identical to No More Heroes. You know, so this this idea that there's only a certain number of, of, of notes and uh, it's inevitable that you're going to copy is just crap. I mean, people go... You know, Can we say crap on the podcast? Is that yeah, like... Well, oh, no, 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 just no, no, no. Crap. Can we say crap? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it's a nonsense. The reality is that if something is successful, it will be imitated and copied. Uh, there's, there are sufficient good new songs out there to prove that uh, there is no limited number of songs. People are constantly creative. Ian has talked about how you can retune a guitar to create different sounds. The reality is, though, that as in any area of IP, in music, people look for shortcuts to creativity, and so they copy. I, I, I remember the very first time when it struck me. I remember, even remember where I was stood at the time. This is this, it's kind of that far in my brain mm-hmm. when I thought, actually, that's, that sounds like it's been copied to me. So it was, um, so I was 
as I was growing up, because my dad was, I was a bit of a Beatles fan because it was kind of like beaten into yeah. me as a, as a kind of kid. Um, loved the Beatles then, loved them now. I uh, really got into the jam. And then the jam did a track called Start, I think it was, which sounded like Taxman. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> and that, that, that was the, I remember where I always stood by a jukebox hearing yeah. it for the first time and thinking, hang on, that's Taxman. <laughs> okay, well, what, what about My Sweet Lord? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My Sweet Lord, George Harrison, one of his very, very famous compositions, he was sued. Uh, by the Chiffons, who wrote a song called He's So Fine. He's So Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, he, yeah. as soon as he was made aware of it, he settled. But you can have conscious copying and you can have unconscious copying. Another great example is the Rolling Stones, where uh, Keith Richard, the Stones were recording an album about 10 years ago, perhaps a bit longer, and there was a song on it called Anybody Seen My Baby, which was released as a single. And Keith Richard tells a story in his autobiography about how he was playing this song to uh, his daughter and and her friends. Uh, And they started singing a completely different song along to the the chorus. And the song which they were singing was a song by K.D. Lang called Constant Craving. Yes. Yeah. And again, he realised that they'd actually subconsciously, he says copied the song and so they added her to the, the, the credits and that's happening more and more now isn't it they just it is happening more and more and I heard another example last week uh, the, the song written by a guy called Jimmy Webb uh, called Do What You Gotta Do which was sampled by someone I can't remember who it was and again that was pointed out to him and he gave Jimmy Webb 40% of the, the credit so there's a lot of this that goes on but sometimes yeah, it's conscious and sometimes I'm reminded it's of another Smiths example. Can I just get another Smiths example? In? <laughs> so R- Rush Hole Ruffians, which, um, which is a great song live, uh, and Johnny Marr freely admitted that... Um, so where, where did he take it from? Uh, Presley's... Uh, his latest flame. Yeah. And, and so in the end, used to play his latest flame and then morph into it because it was, yeah. it was so yes, obvious yes. that... Uh, yeah. So I know a little bit about music, mate. No, you know loads. <laughs> loads but, so... so Ed Sheeran is actually quite a good kind of lodestone for the, the, the way people feel about music at the moment. He's in, intensely creative. He's very successful. He's a massive victim of where there's a hit, there's a writ. Whoa. Every time he comes out with anything, you know, he... He, he, he is just guitar and man, the voice, though, isn't it? It's, 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 it's him, a lot of man. It's a, did yeah. you say man? Is he modelled on you, though, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is, yeah. But it's interesting. So, so you've got Ed Sheeran sort of kind of basically quite rightly after all what he's been through, saying, how are you supposed to not be accused of copying? On the other hand, you've got Ed Sheeran, who is massively successful because the copyright system in the end has looked after him and means that he's able to sell songs and the, through the PRS or whatever, the reward comes back to him. When he said that, what do you think he was actually, what, what's the point he was trying to get across? It can't be that the copyright system doesn't work or shouldn't exist because he, he benefits from it so much. So is he more railing at, where it sits, or is it just is he just shouting at the lawyers? I think it's all of that. I mean, firstly, with Ed Sheeran, he has been subject to a number of copyright uh, disputes. Some within my knowledge, because I was involved in them. Oh wow! Uh, and you know, some of these aren't public. But whenever you have a case where someone is accused of copying someone else's song, the first thing you do is run to a musicologist. A musicologist is an expert at comparing songs to determine whether one is a copy of another. There was a a case that I had where um, we we went to a musicologist on a a particular song. Uh, Everyone who's heard it, and I'll play it for you after the podcast, see what you think, uh, (laughs) thought this was definitely a copy. Uh, The musicologist concluded it wasn't a copy. It was, uh, I think, was it a mashup, the description that he used? But you can have situations where successful composers write a song which sounds like another song, but isn't. So technically, if you look at the notation, (coughs) it's not the same notes. So technically, it's not a copyright infringement. But if it sounds the same, it it, it reminds you of that other song. I think what Ed Sheeran is really getting at, and it's something which I think is very important, is the inequality of arms, not just financially, but also reputationally. So if, if you're a struggling composer and you think you've been ripped off by a very well-known 
band or, or, or composer, it's very difficult for you in court to assert your case because you're going to need hundreds of thousands of pounds to prove it. Not just on lawyers, but also these forensic musicologists that I mentioned. So there's an inequality of arms there. But also, there's a, a converse inequality of reputation. So someone like Ed Sheeran, if he's sued, Mud has a habit of sticking. Yeah. yeah. So even if he's completely innocent, people will always remember Ed Sheeran as being associated with a case in which he was accused of plagiarism, whereas the person who brought the case, you will never remember their name ever again. And so that inequality uh, says more about the, the UK's court system and the approach to litigation than, than I think uh, the actual dispute itself. But um, there are some composers that have a habit of finishing up regularly before the courts. And, you know, you do have to ask why sometimes. I mean, is that just sense. because they do stuff that's popular? So, and, and if it's popular... It's well, there, there is definitely a, an adage, where there's a hit, there's a writ. That is definitely true. And I've seen many examples of cases where no one was interested in a song at all, and then suddenly it became really um, popular. There was a case I did many years ago where there was this, this Italian song which was only famous in Naples, in the area around Naples. And no one had ever heard his bloody song, except in the 1950s in Naples. And then somehow, Levi Jeans managed to find it and used it as an advert um, for their, their new jeans, whichever one it was. And it was put on MTV. And it was seen on MTV all around the world. And then suddenly it became really popular because of it. And so suddenly, from being worth zero, this piece of music was worth hundreds of thousands of pounds for license fees. And that can happen quite quickly. I, I was just going to say, there's one, one interesting point, um, well, actually two interesting points about the kind of Ed Sheeran case, I think. The first one, I, I just find it quite funny. There was uh, quite a few news articles, um, you know, because each, each side had a musicologist, you know, to assess how similar the songs were to each other. Uh, and the newspaper article seemed to be sort of amazed that one musicologist said, yeah, they're really, really similar. And the other one's like, no, they're completely different. <laughs> it just made me chuckle because, you know, obviously that's going to happen. But I think it does show that this is still subjective in a way. Um, the other thing that I think is quite interesting is that, you know, as a result of this and perhaps, yeah, thinking about kind of reputation and just trying to avoid, you know, uh, you know everything that comes comes with being on the receiving end of, of, of these things. Um, Ed Sheeran and songwriting partners are now recording all of their songwriting sessions, so they can they can sort of demonstrate the origin mm -hmm. of any ideas that they come That's up. Very with. Very good idea. Well, it, it's it 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 is, but like from my perspective, I wonder how much that affects creativity because you know. Sometimes you come up with a song in the shower or, you know, walking the dog or something like that. And you're not going to have your recording equipment with you. And if you're if you're being forced to be creative, you know, only at certain times of day in a certain room, you know, what happens to all of the other ideas? So I think it's, you know, I understand why that's in place, but in a way it feels like a little bit of a shame in terms of kind of limiting creativity. Have you ever seen a, there was a, a great film made in the late 1960s? I'm showing my age here by a French director called Jean-Luc Godard, I think, and it was about the genesis of the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil. And it was showing the creative process from the very first bars of the song to the finished product. And, and it was fascinating because the original song was completely different to the recorded version. But although there was a camera, or several cameras, showing the whole creative process, it didn't affect the creative process. I think the issue I would have, Ian, with what you've just said, is how do we know that they pressed the record button at the right time? How do we know that they didn't listen to someone else's song first and then oh, press the record button? Good lawyer. Yeah. This is your lawyer. That's the lawyer you are. I was going to say, we, we, we've just talked about musicologists giving two different opinions and we're in a room of lawyers. So it's, like, come on, it's, it's, what, you, it's what you guys are paid to do. And, I, and, and the Rolling Stones, of course, uh, only recorded in Holland, didn't they, to avoid tax. So, in terms of impact on the Fran, can process, we just know we might have to take that one no, out? That's true. Well, <laughs> I think that's just true. It was France, it was France actually. Was it France, right? Okay. South of France, Exile and Main Street recorded in South of yeah. France. Um, so, yeah, oh, it's been corroborated. The law, the law has stepped in before to 
But I guess that's, that's quite there, cool. And there, though, is, there is a little cynic in me that thinks that you would only really try and capture the recording process because you think there's a future Let It Be film in there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I was actually so. This is interesting. I, well, no, hang on. I think this is interesting. <laughs> Let's let the room decide. Um, we had a, a we had that podcast the other day with John Noble from the. We British did British, British brands. brands. Yeah, yeah. My, my dear friend. Yeah, oh, you know John. Okay, that's a brilliant, great guy, great podcaster, and he was talking about. Um, lookalike. What's the word for it? Um, not lookalike packaging. Parasitic. Parasitic. Parasitic packaging. Parasitic packaging. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And it obviously struck a chord. Where? Oh, he's on fire. Note of caution. Note. Oh, that wasn't so good. That's terrible. Right. I've <laughs> <laughs> got a groan. You've got a, you, you, you actually got a groan. Finally, You've got, got a groan. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was talking about parasitic packaging. Thank you very much. And the idea that, again, in a very totally different world, but with IP attached to it, something goes out there, in this case, packaging that makes you kind of like the look of a, a product, and then somebody else has a look at it, admittedly, deliberately, rather than um, accidentally, and tries to work out how close they can yeah. get before they are actually trading on what the what the other people did, it's a very strong parallel there with the music thing, isn't it? You listen to a there is music there is there, it, 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 all areas of IP are, have that that common theme. the The problem is is actually that in the UK we have general principles of fair competition. So in, and I know John very well. I know his issues very well. There, the the the, the big supermarkets especially, make sure that they produce products which look like John's members' products, but make it clear that it's an own brand, so you can't sue them for what's called passing off. That is actually fair and free competition. But if you had the same situation in Germany or Australia or other parts of Europe, that would be unfair competition. And uh, that, that is, is, is the problem. Where do you draw the line between what's fair and what is unfair? So it's a direct parallel. Would you say that yes. fair, and, fair and unfair probably yeah. is about in the same place? Yes, and, and in the music industry, in copyright disputes, you, you draw that line based on the evidence of musicologists. Yeah. So you told you it was interesting. Yeah. In, in, in order to prove a case of copyright infringement, just, just to, to finish this point, mm. you have to show two elements. You have to show, firstly, that the person who is alleged to have copied would have had access to the the other uh, song that you say was yeah. was infringed. Yeah. So what it really means is would Ed Sheeran, for example, have ever heard this this song by an unknown artist or composer who says Ed Sheeran copied me. If there is enough evidence to suggest that there has been access to it, you then have an objective test of whether the songs are sufficiently similar to warrant that uh, to, to warrant a case of infringement. That's where the musicologist comes in. They assess the objective similarity. But there is then uh, a, another factor, which is that if you decide, if you can't prove that there was sufficient access, but the songs are very similar, there is an inference that the only way they would have come to that similar song was by having copied. So there's quite a few hurdles to... That's, that's, that's quite a test, isn't it? That's a, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's why most of these cases never succeed. And there is a distinction there, isn't there? Because I think what we're talking about with the brands aspect was that the, the person who applies the test is not the musicologist, the expert, but is the, the, the consumer. Yeah. So there's a slight difference there, actually, isn't there? So the man on the clapper omnibus. The man on the clapper omnibus. You got very cross when I said the, the moron in the hurry I got told off for. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, but then you were, you were untold off for it, I remember. Yeah, because I forget why. Yeah. yeah. Got away with it. <laughs> it, was, it was a week ago. There's no reason why you, <laughs> so no no reason why you should Thousand remember days. it. Yes. Ian, I think that you said that you might share with us some of your, um, and not so yours, but the great tech um, patents, what are the kind of the big music tech patents? Well, one, um, probably my all-time favourite music tech patent, I don't know if you've seen it, the Van Halen one. Yes! I, no, I actually have. This was in another podcast. It was in the Rock on Tours podcast. So yeah, carry on. <laughs> oh, no one moving on. It's, it, it's basically got probably the best patent drawing I've ever seen. It's kind of like... If if there is such a thing as a rock and roll patent drawing, it's that. <laughs> uh, so it's you know it's uh, when I when I decided to start sort of collecting music tech patents, it's the first one I went for. It's the first first one on the blog, and if I you know 
if I was ever to collect them into, I don't know, like a book or something, that would be on the front. No, there's a super, there is a super book in this, isn't there? There yeah, is yeah, definitely yeah, yeah. a super Maybe book. Maybe break yeah. super book. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I just, I just, I love it because, you know, patent drawings, you know, there are some weird and wonderful things in it, but I think they managed to, uh, you know, inject a bit of, of rock and roll into a patent. And I, I, I love that one for it. There's an, a, another kind of quite interesting one that I was looking at recently because each each week i try and feature a music tech patent on like my website and, and share it on what's the website give, a, give us a link patentsrock.com <laughs> oh, you gotta go there <laughs> <laughs> thank you and you know there's there's a real there's a real variety of things on there there's you know a few sort of you know wacky inventions there's a few i guess well-known ones and then there are a few i guess like more more, more modern patents and and there was one recently by um company called i think it's neura holdings who have headphones called neurophones i don't know if anyone's seen them but it's quite interesting in like a technology sense and also in a in a pattern sense and hopefully sort of not, not getting into too much detail oh no go for it I mean, the headphones you know one of the interesting things about them is they kind of adapt the sound or you know, it is claimed that they adapt the sound to an individual listener. So, you know, all of our ears are different yeah. and we all hear music in different ways. And, you know, um, you know, there might be a view that it's just how loud or quiet it is, but, you know, a next level beyond that is something called like EQ. So, you know, a little yeah. bit more bass, a little bit more middle, yeah. a little bit more treble, and, you know, you probably had a hi-fi where you can slide the, yes. the bits up and down and, and change the sound. And, you know, different people hear things differently. And one of the things that they're, you know, claiming to do is, you know, sort of like interrogate your your eardrum by sending like a test signal, see what bounces back. And then they sort of adjust the EQ of real music so that it's like optimized for your own ear, which I think is quite interesting. And that's like, you know, kind of on the software side of things. But in that same product as well, they have, um, I think, quite an interesting, um, like, headphone design as well, because they have an over-ear, or, you know, two over-ear cups on the headphone, but they also have the little earbuds in it as well. So it's a headphone that has two different types of kind of speaker, and the ones that go in your ear, you hear all of the, like, the higher and mid-frequencies, and then the bigger ones on the outside pump out the bass, but it doesn't go into your eardrum. It just rattles your ear. Yeah, it goes through, goes through your head. So it's, it's it's kind of interesting that with a product like that, there's there's like the software side of things. There's like the kind of like hardware side of things, and then from the patent perspective, it's like, well, how many patents do you need to cover that? Because it might be hard to get both of those things covered in one patent, and you know. A, a, I mean, you know, I, they're not a client of mine. I don't know the history of all of it, and I haven't looked through all of their their patents. But it's kind of interesting that you, you know, on the one hand, you see a, a product, but actually, when you drill down into it, there's you know potentially so many different new bits of technology that are like independently protectable. So I think that's quite an interesting one as well. Mm. I'm just I'm blown away by that. I'm, I'm, I'm now thinking you're on about the headphones, that. You're on the headphones. Well, I've got like twenty five quid off of uh, popular online retailer kind of in-ear things that... I still think you should know that on, on uh, long-haul flights in the 70s and 80s when you had the ones that had an air pipe. Oh, yes! That was enough for me. <laughs> yes, no, I, yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, you're going to... No, gonna I'm, 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 nearly, I'm nearly done on questions. I'm just fascinated by some of the, the copyright side and where it's going to go. I mean, we've seen the... Uh, we've talked about commoditization a little bit earlier on, actually. And I, we, have we, I think we might have reached ultimate commoditization with things like Spotify and these models here. Um, you mentioned that artists you think are getting a reward, but maybe not just reward. Do you think the money's going to the wrong place? First, the, the money's definitely going to the wrong place, number one. The second question is, is there enough money that's going to the wrong place? Because in the old days when you were selling CDs or vinyl or cassettes, 
So just for, just for the people that are in the audience, cassettes. So little bits of tape that you could wind with a pencil. Um, it's, no, it's, it's just that Charlotte and I have a conversation earlier and I said that I'm going to see it. What, what is a cassette? I, well, I'm, I'm going to see the drummer in my band from 35 years ago in about three weeks' time. I've not seen him for decades. And he says that he might have a cassette somewhere of us playing. Uh, and Charlotte said to me, what do you do with that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, see, not all bad. That's, that's true. Getting a tape recorder <laughs> that plays cassettes is really, really hard. I still have one. Uh, I've got one as well. Sorry, sorry, Nick, I threw you there. Carry on, carry on, carry on. Not, carry on. not, 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 not at all. And, you know, back in the, in the 70s, if you sold 200,000 singles... You, you know, you would earn a lot of money. You would. But today, to earn the same amount of money, you would have to sell probably, you know, billions of streams. So the, the last figure I heard was that in order to earn £100 from use of your music on YouTube, you would have to have over a million hits wow. on YouTube. Whereas in days gone by... To have a hundred, to to earn a hundred quid from sales of a CD or a, or a single wasn't that difficult. So, because the major tech companies, Amazon, Spotify, Apple, are the main licensees of music these days, because they're such big organisations, they can drive down the amount of money that's paid. Is, is that is that is that why live performance is such a because I'm conscious that everyone is performing live these days. And the reason for that, well, I'll tell you in a second who the most clever people are. But the, yes, the re- bands like the Rolling Stones, they don't earn anything from back issues. I mean, we all bought their stuff 50 years ago. They make their money from selling tickets to go and see them a mile away in Hyde Park yeah. for £100 a person. Yeah. £100 times 60,000 people there, plus the merchandise, plus the drinks. That's where the money is earned from, not from the actual music. The music is the means by which they're able to earn money from all these. So that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I always understood when I was growing up, I always understood that live performance sold albums. That, that's what that used about. to be the case. Yeah. It used to be the case that in order to sell an album, you need to tour it. But I mean, again, many of the people here won't remember, but ABBA, ABBA in the seventies were unbelievably successful. Well, why? Because they wrote great songs. But what they did, which was really, really innovative in the mid-70s, was that every single they released was accompanied by a video. And if or those of us old enough to remember can think of the song, and it's hard to uh, distance it from the video that came out. Yeah. And those videos were seen by everyone around the world at the same time, which meant that they didn't have to tour Australia. Yeah. They didn't have to go on a tour of Italy. Or America, everyone's connected with ABBA through the medium of a video at the same time, which meant they had colossal worldwide sales. They only toured, I think, the UK twice, but they've done it again because ABBA have now got this new show. The, the a, virtual thing, the holograms. Yeah. yeah. Where their avatars of ABBA, as they were in the 70s, so they don't have to perform live, they just play this digital. That's amazing, every, isn't it? Every night at a purpose built venue with the same songs every night and people aren't really bothered, you can play that concert or that concert can take place every night of the week in England forever. I think that's the plan, by the way. And you can have it simultaneously anywhere in the world at the same time. So you can have it in New York, Rome, Sydney and London at the same time and just think how much money they're making from that. Are those the really clever ones that you just mentioned? Is that, yeah. That's the, that's the kind of the... Yeah, I think that's like, brilliant. Yeah. I've got a colleague who actually went to that and her, she said it was brilliant. She's glad she's done it. She's not going again. Um, <laughs> but if everyone in the planet does that. It's, just, it's, it's quite interesting. Just, I guess, like, slightly offering a different perspective on the, you know, um, you know, Spotify streaming platforms and, you know, relatively low financial returns from people listening to your music. You know, being, um, you know, I write and record my own music playing small bands you know for for us ease of distribution onto spotify youtube you know all of these places apple music amazon is amazing because 
if I go back like 20 years, how can I get my music so that someone could listen to it if they mm. wanted to? Someone on the other side of the world. It's impossible. No one's going to find out about me. And the good, the good thing about these platforms is, you know, if someone can find out about you, they can listen to your music. And I don't play music to make money. I lose money. Play, I lose so much money, you know, playing music. Whether I do it live, recording, doesn't matter. I'm not going to make money, but I'm not doing it for that reason. Oh. And if you're, if you're not doing it for that reason, <laughs> yeah, if you're not doing it for that reason, it's a great way to be able to, you know, get your music in front of people. And, you know, if you're lucky and you can get on, you know, a playlist that's the right type of music, you get a bit more heard. But, you know, I look at the royalties that I've received from my you know, single I released at the start of last year. It's about a pound or something. So, you know, the cost of producing it is we, so much. We can better. absolutely get a link in the podcast to that so that we can up your royalties. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, I, no, we're going to double it. I think, I think we can at least, it. I was going to say, we can at least um, double it. A mate of mine. Um, you pointed at me then when you said a mate of mine. A um, mate oh, of mine. mate. Another mate of mine. A real mate of mine. <laughs> No, uh, a mate of mine uh, who's a lead guitarist in the office band, Mark Smith. I'll give him a little plug. He said the definition. The Mark Smith. The Mark Smith. Yeah, of Black Eyed Peas. Um, he said the definition of a professional musician is someone who has five thousand pounds worth of kit, which they put into a five hundred pound car to get fifty pounds for a gig. <laughs> well, they're, they're doing well. I mean, most of the gigs, <laughs> most of the gigs I, I play are effectively pay to play. Mm. You don't get you don't get paid. You've got to pay to practice. You've got to pay to get there. You've got to pay to maintain your instrument. You've got to yeah. pay for beers and what have you when you're there. You've got to pay to get home. You know, like you 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 literally lose so much money playing a gig. You don't do it because you want to make money you do it because you en- you enjoy it and it's 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 the thing that you do so i think you know for for people starting out it's in- it's incredibly hard you have to accept that you're going to be paying to play and you know unless and until you get to actually a pretty pretty good level Grillam, i'm going to do that really annoying thing i do on the really good podcasts mm-hmm. it's a really good Good podcast. You just glance down. You've done an hour, and you yeah. sort of think, yeah. yeah. And I'm conscious we've got another one to record yet today. You're not finished yeah. yet, mate. So, so, I'm, Ian, Nick, I'm going to have to bring it to a close. That's no problem. We, we absolutely can have you back on at some point in the future yeah. because there's so much more that we could we could explore in this. But um, it's always my job, and I've been thinking as we've been going along. It's always my job to try and end up with a question that is kind of tangentially related to the sorts of things that we've been talking about, but maybe not immediately. So it's not going to be about IP or anything like that, but I'll make it about, can I make it about music? Is that all right? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, you can let me have this one? Seems yeah. relevant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you remember to ask me this time though, rather Yay, than just forget me? No, yeah. I thought you wanted it yourself. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'll go to Ian first, because yeah. he's, he's, he's kind of like the proper muso in the group, isn't he? Well, um, well, I wouldn't say that. No, definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Is there one song that you hear and you think, wish I'd written that? What's your... But yeah, that would be my. If I, yeah, if I could have written a song, Oh, uh, that's a different question from what's your all-time favourite song. You know what? I it's 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 funny. It's not the sort of music I listen to at all. But I have a huge amount of admiration in terms of songwriting for ABBA. I would say pretty much any ABBA song. I would say I wish I'd written that because the, the thing that I think is great about ABBA songs is you can hear an ABBA song once. Mm-hmm. And you remember it. And I think the reason for that is, I've been trying to like reverse engineer it. They use relatively few syllables in the chorus. Yeah. So like Waterloo, yeah. Dancing <laughs> Queen, Take a Chance. What whatever, whatever, you know. SOS. SOS. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you throw something quite short at people lots of times in three or three and a half minutes, then it's that little earworm that stays in your head. So... I would say, yeah, if there are any songs that I wish I could have written and, you know, the the songwriting style I try to follow is make anything that is, like, as instantly memorable as ABBA. Mm. Wow. That's great. Uh, that's a brilliant answer. A good insight, too. Yeah. So, yeah, hard act to follow, Nick, but you've got to do it. Come on. What a song. Yeah. <laughs> Funny enough, I saw um, Daniel Craig was asked this question recently and... I agree with his answer. The song is a song called Love and Affection by Joan Armour Trading. And it's the difference between uh, being in love with someone and having affection for someone. And there's a great line, with a friend I can dance, but with a lover I can really move. 
And it's it's all about that distinction between when you're in love with someone or when you you are loved by someone, and you have a great friendship with someone. And it's it's a very very clever. That's song. That's really powerful. That's um, it's a, it's a superb song. Yeah. I'm, I'm Interestingly, gonna... written about the same time as the other songs. That's when songwriting was at its peak, mid seventies. So I'm now dreading this, but I'm going to go there anyway. <laughs> Postman Pat, no. Um, <laughs> no, interestingly, both of your answers have been more, I would say, lyrical than musical, if I may, um, oh, which, is, which is cool. Which is cool. Because uh, I'm going on the, on the musical front. I'd go for Wild World by Cat Stevens. Uh, yeah, Wild World, because the chorus is three chords. And you've got an amazing, you'd think there were no bits of music left to get, I'd go back to Ed Sheeran's 12 notes point, you'd think there were no bits of music left with three chords. And it's a totally hooky, brilliant, beautiful bit of music. Just three chords. The, the verse has got so the fifths or something, but yeah, a bit of music there. Just checking some chords. Um, wait a minute. Oh, Lee. <laughs> what's, what's the song you were you written? <laughs> is it Peach? At, least, at least you remembered how to do a podcast, which is great. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. But I'm going to go back to a kind of like an old favourite. And, and again, it's going to be musical, not lyrical, because the lyrics are actually entirely rubbish. Um, so I'm going to Little Smiths, and because uh, I think I believe that Johnny Marr is the closest thing to God on the planet. I've been and, and I will just say that Johnny Marr was 21 when he wrote How Soon Is Now, and I'll just end it there. <laughs>